Thank you guys for uh, taking time out. I think I know about a third of you have worked with you in some way or the other, either together or vendor relationship, or customer relationship, and appreciate all you folks coming. Um, so Scott asked me um, two weeks ago to give a talk. I was going to do my patented, the data you give me and what I actually do with it. But somebody had done that recently, so I got this reliability of Microdia and what is currently going on in the industry, what people are doing, and how to test for this. It's got that, that would be a good idea. So what I'm sharing with you is a lot of the data that we have collected over the years. So just to give you uh, some background. I've been doing microbial reliability tests with customers, national labs and military customers, for 14 years. And a lot of the data that we're, we're reviewing today is all the stuff we have learned over the last 14 years of what works, what doesn't work. When microbials fail, there is a working committee in IPC called Weak Microbial Reliability. We don't know why they fail. 100% of the time. We don't know why. We're still trying to figure that out. But what I'm sharing with you today is what you can do to test and some rules that will work to give you reliable microbials. You're free to have disagree with me if you want. I'm uh, like, no, I've been building them that way for years. I know. So what about? Uh, just to give you a background, I'm going to talk to test customers about stacking three microbials or more. They said, well, maybe you don't do it. I go, I built a 30 layer board that had microbials in every dial and drill. We delivered it in six weeks. I can build them. They just don't survive the seven. So, um, just giving you all that background, uh, that's what this is about, all the test methods that are available. And if we move along really good, I'll get into some really good examples of three stacked microbials that actually pass and when they actually fail. As we're learning what is triggering these failures, and sometimes they pass. So that's what I hope to have. Feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. This is really for uh, to share with you what we've learned so that we can all build reliably designed high density interconnections that will work in the field. <laughs> it works when I press it up. This might be the reason why you're here today. I've seen this phenomenon over and over again, and is that we learned about three stack microbias myself four or five years ago. I'd be the only guy telling a customer, do not stack three stack with that 1600 A6 space board that you can't reuse if it doesn't work, that cost you hundred thousand dollars a chip. It won't work. And I've told one of them wrong condition. I had one customer said, I'm not building it because you're just going to have problems. They gave it to my other customer, the same design. I know that design. I, I'll tell you what I told the other guy. I'm not building it because it won't work. Four months later, I'm in the second company's lab with two PhDs going, it worked when we pushed down on it. And I go, yeah, I know that design. You got four to three stack microbias, and you got it in open. I say, well, how did you know? That's what this is about, what learning is all about. But it might be a reliability. So, IPC 6012 is a performance requ uh, requirement under finishing order that meets the requirements. This warning will go into IPC 6012 revenue. It's going to be in the document where it's going to say, oh, well, sorry I have to read it through, but there have been many examples of post fabrication microbial failures over the last several years. Typically, these failures occur during reflow. However, they are often undetectable latent at room temperature. The further along the assembly process, the failure manifests themselves and more expensive they become. If they remain undetected until after the product is placed into service, they become a much greater cost, risk, and more importantly, they pose a safety risk. This statement will be in IPC 6012 Rev E, probably in February. And some of you guys have experienced this. You see, why did it happen? I'm not sure. Maybe it's the board fabricator. Maybe it's just the way we designed it. That's going in there because of this continuous situation that is occurring. Accelerated testing. If you can verify before you should prepare boards and make sure that the process is good, yes. So that statement reads like any microbial yeah. that is not stacked. Yeah. Yeah. I can design a microbial that going through a 6x refill, and as an example in here, one stack looks fine, meets all IPC requirements. During a 6x refill at 260, pop, 
changed the dielectric one mil thinner, made the mic be a one mil thicker. My hair, by the way, is exactly calibrated to two mils. <laughs> so changing the, the diameter of the microbia and the dielectric half of my hair, 100% pass. Single microbia. So do you think that's going to drive people, more people away from you? Or are we going to drive people to use microbia now? No. You just got to drive them and understand the geometries that work. So use the right construction and right, right to construction and geometries. The aspect ratio, the diameter. And I'll tell you a story. 2003 or 4, some PhD fellow at a big semiconductor company analyzed the microbia and said, in order, for, he had nothing to do with print circuit boards. Assembly, design, nothing. He was just a physicist fellow on staff. He analyzed microbias and he came back and told us, six, the microbia has to be six in order to survive assembly. What do you know, old man? And I blew him off. Until I got in an argument with somebody who barked out six mil microbia diameters, and I'm like, that's what the guy told me a decade ago. I went back and built coupons, four, six, and eight. The, eight, the six and eight went a thousand cycles on an IST tester. Didn't pass, didn't fail. The fours, around the 300 to 400 cycles, randomly they would show up as opens. So the guy, I'm stubborn, but I will learn. Their geometries play a difference. The aspect ratio plays a difference. And so we'll go over those um, items today. Uh, OM testing, uh, the OM tester, which is what I'm talking about, it's a tester that has a chamber in which you put a coupon that was built along with your boards with the same geometry, same drill sizes, same pad sizes in the board. If you have staggered microbias or staggered buried mechanical, you put those same patterns in the coupon and you thermal cycle it at reef level just like you do a board. And it has a four Kelvin wire on each net. And if the resistance changes, it goes open. It's a failure. It actually is testing during reef low temperature. Okay, and you'll see some pictures where at reef low, it's an open. At room temperature on the same coupon, you connect it again. The next cycle just keeps on doing it. And if you're not measuring, and validating at reflow, you don't know if it's reliable or not. Um, we're going to review current, uh, current methods that right now IBC says this is all you have to do, and we get to ship you the boards. That's all you have right now. Uh, and there are limitations. Uh, temperature uh, test methods that were previously out there, hats and IST testing, uh, why these methods fail to provide the assessment, OM testing is a real-world evaluation. It's actually the reflow temperature. You do 10 lead, you set it at 230. You do lead free, you set it at 260. And it's measuring and it records the temperature. On every test, it measures resistance on every coupon. And then I'll summarize all this stuff together. Jerry? Yes. How important is it part of the process of the analysis controlling the rate of change? You, you have to control it, just like any of you guys that do assembly. If somebody rises the temperature too fast, it'll pop the board. You can't just go from instantaneous to reflow temperature. You, it'll pop the board. You've got to slowly bring it up to temperature. This tester does exactly that. It rises the temperature and controls it at the same rate as you would reflow an actual board. So it's a real world, real world test where the heat is actually on the coupon, coming on just like you do in assembly. How much is that to cost? If you just do 6x reflow, it could be about $750 for the lot. You can flip 24 coupons in the chamber. Okay. Okay? But if you do temperature cycling, that could take up to two days to do minus 40, 125, minus 40, 125, that could take up to two days. Okay. So the, the current method by the board right now for IPC 612 is I have thermal stress. Solder flow. Flop set, bake them first, flop set, put it on, float it, take it off for a certain part of the amount of time, float it, do that six times, cross section, and I'll talk about all those things. So that's thermal stress. Uh, cross section evaluation. You microwave to evaluate the different stratas to see if anything's happening. <coughs> a board shop is doing class three, has to do a monthly conformance testing, which we take the most complicated board, one board. And we test it. And that certifies you for everything you build for the entire month. 
but in no way is it checking for microbeads at all. So what well, they do is group D testing. A monthly conform says, well, it's not doing anything to validate whether they can make microbeads or not. Um, we, elect, uh, we do electrical tests on boards. How many guys have done this? And it's always a trigger that I know the boards have an assembly process. We built, you built some boards for us. We ran it through the reflow of it. We want you to retest them to see if there's any new opens. Anybody done that? Especially when they do three or four stack microbeads, they think if they reheat it, it'll make the weakness show up and they'll bring it back at room temperature and test it at room temperature. You will not see the defect. We will make more money testing boards, they'll all pass. You won't find it. And usually when I see that, I realize that somebody has a design problem. Uh, they can't get to assemble. And now we have this new method, the D coupon, which is the only approved coupon that I can see by the D32 committee. And the test method for reflow, which is 2.6.27a. Rev B will be released on February. And then we have a temperature cycle, which is 2.6.7.2, which is minus whatever you saw, say, minus 25, 100, minus 40, 125, whatever you decide, that's the test uh, that we will do. So, traditional thermal stress test. Um, you reflow the coupon, like I described. We've been doing this since forever, the 80s, right? The problem is, and then we micro You do the polish condition, and then you micro and you say, well, everything looks fine. When we evaluate this, we're at 100x. That's all that's required. If there's an anomaly, we can go to 200x. If there's nothing that can be discernibly that there's something there, then it's acceptable, even though you couldn't make a judgment call on it. This is all that's required. Micro are really small. Again, these micro are I recommend six, but there could be fours or, or fives. You're not really evaluating very close. These are magnifications at 300x and at 3000x. At 3000x, this is micro edge, you can kind of see separation. There's two conditions. When you micro it, you can see all these different stratas of the copper, original copper, plated copper, and all that. Before you micro it, this is what's called as the as polished condition. In the as polished condition, you can't see any separation. This is already micro -edged. Once the micro edge has been touched on the coupon, no more as received, as polished condition can be evaluated. Because micro edge will seep right into the electrolysis further and further back. So you can't make a judgment call on separation if you touch it with micro edge. You have to do it, but then you micro edge afterwards, so the evidence is now done. You have to snap a picture and then look at it. So the end result, they're all the micro edge. But this is a magnification of three edges of separation. Definitely a perfect. And this is the thing that we might be a reliability group is looking at. We don't know when or why this triggers. Is it because it's oxidized, it sat out longer, it sat out five days worth of one other times it's been built in one day through that process and it did happen. It's had separation, but it doesn't happen. We don't know why and when it triggers. What causes them to fit? So here's an example. In the as polished condition, we can't see the stratus because it has been micro -mush. Two inch reflow, you can kind of see a little bit of a line. But at 10 and left free, which is a higher Severe thing. Well, by the way, the difference between 230 and 260C, 30 degrees C, the strain increase on the glass epoxy goes up 150% in that 30 degree C. So when you go to that elevated temperature, you are putting far more strain. It's not linear. It goes in much bigger magnitude. These defects, that separation can be caught on an ion mill, and then you can kind of see it. But at 200x, you're not even seeing this. You're definitely not going to see that. And these separations here, you have to go to like 3,000x or higher to see these failures. Nobody has the machines. Nobody has the time to do that. Yes, sir. So, again, I'm not understanding. Maybe you're going to explain this. How does the aspect ratio on that hole make a difference on that surface point of connection? Don't have the science. All I know is the aspect ratio. There is a mismatch between the solid copper and the glass epoxy expansion. Pretty much everybody is looking to target 0.75 to 1 or less because they survive, just like the PhD, you go to 6. Aspect ratio 0.75 to 1 or less. 
Because once you get to one, yeah, I start seeing failures at a reflow temperature. I don't have the science, I don't have the resistance. The VO went open at reflow temperature and reconnected when it got back to room temperature. So when you get, you push to the one one, you'll start seeing failures. When you get short and squatty, they'll pass. Monthly conformance testing, you're doing rework simulation, resistance testing, boss rate, kill strength, dielectric, standing voltage, moisture insulation. The conclusion doesn't identify any weak via structure. So even though your bore shop is doing the right thing, if they're class three, it's monthly. They are not evaluating their ability to make microdues. This is, this is all we have right now for the industry. The other test method in the board is we electrically test at room temperature, ambient. So if you have a weak microvia that, that during reflow went open and cooled down, reconnected, what we call self healing, um, they'll pass this tester every time. This is reflow. This is during reflow. This is the rise, just like a, a, um, a reflow chamber. But this is a coupon chamber where the coupons are in this chamber. It's about 14 inches in diameter, and the coupons just get plugged in, and then it pushes the heat in there. It's measuring the air in the chamber so, so it can control the rise and descent. And then there's a temperature right on the coupon. So the temperature is right on the coupon. It knows what the temperature that the coupon is going to. When it reaches those temperatures, if the resistance goes over a 5% threshold, it's a bad coupon. And if you can see here, during the first reflow, and that's what um, I don't use either 230 or 260 in this example. I should have done that, I'm sorry. On the second reflow, there is a tool that's failing, it's got over the 5%. And after each additional reflow cycle, it gets higher and higher. But what you'll notice, the resistance returns back to connected as it starts to cool down. This is what the tester will do. Now, we've had other accelerated tests, we've had hats. Been around for a while. You take the coupons by themselves and you put them in, chain, in the reflow six times. You're not measuring the <coughs> six times. Then you put it in a thermal cycle in chamber. You can set whatever temperature cycle times, but it's set in about every 10 seconds a coupon or each net. This is the OM tester that had. Thermal shock. There was a reflow that happened first. It does 6x reflow, but had the 4 Kelvin wire on it. It actually tested to see if the resistance changed. So if you have a hash test, this is all you've got. They went 100 cycles during thermal shock, and as far as hats is concerned, because it didn't measure temperature during reflow, this was going to pass. You guys notice the yellow? On an OM tester, it says, yeah, this passed thermal shock. But during reflow, it went open in the second cycle, the third cycle, the fifth cycle, and the second cycle. So if you did hats testing, you would have got a good report that they're all good. But in reality, during the 6x reflow, they went open. And not only that, one went in the second cycle. Because the hats is not connected to a 4 calibre wire measuring resistance during reflow. And this is what we had up until the home tester. That and the IST test, which measures belt fault resistance, determines resistivity, which is these words, apply. they calculate the hot resistance, they supply and apply DC current, they monitor the interconnects and achieve required temperature, cycle test, and monitor. All this, in reality, what it's doing, it has no heating chamber. It does a 6x simulated reflow, and then it does thermal temperature cycling, calculating. What it does is generates heat in the coupon by running current through it. How many of you guys heat up your board from the inside out for assembly? <coughs> the heat's from the outside in, which is a whole different dynamic on the strain and stress of the interconnects. So, their tester is a heating coil. This is the thermal image from IPC test method 
I didn't make this picture up. This is straight from my PC. This is a thermal map of the coupon during test. Where's the heat the highest at? Where are the heating coils that heat the highest at? What's straight in the microvenus? These are my failed coupons from different panels. The little dot is the failure. Do you think I put the leakage microbial on different panels in different locations, always in the same exact spot that would fail? No. But that's where the greatest strain was, and that's where it failed. That recommendation is to take the theoretical temperature and take it to 190C. Does anybody know what happens to resin? Some of you Atlanta guys, you can chime in here. They know you're in there. Don't worry, check out blue. What happens if you take the resin above the melting point? Bounce and boils. Every one of these microbeas left the board. They rocket shipped off once they got to the melting point. And then they, they write a document that you need to do a corrective action and evaluation on failure. Well, the evidence is rocketed off the board, so I really can't give you a failure analysis. <laughs> okay. They say simulated reflow, thermal shock temperatures. Well, they don't have a freezing, so that's how. But they said reflow simulation. What is that? And how would you attach that to a circuit board? Sign. So do you really think we're going to reflow temperature? It fall off. So technically, that is not a cheap reflow. We're the only tester in the chamber. The whole chamber is being measured in temperature, and it's actually achieving reflow temperature. And you can see the flux on there too. So making my point, this thing has never seen reflow. The greatest heat is in the center. And it's not a valid test to check. A sampling of different interconnects to see if the process was reliable. Sure. So, creating vision, the thermal shock for the six or whatever first. And then, I don't think that's an accurate representation by a steeple because you run a power down. Next to every single one. Yeah, the power end goes back and forth, so you like this, usually on the inner layer. Yeah. And the power, you're running current through there, sure. creates heat, heating from the inside out. Okay. By the way, I found. Well, in the middle, yeah. But if there's heat, the center is still going to be hotter than the outside. Because okay. it's, it's in the room. It's, if you've seen the picture, it just sits in the room and it's open. Okay. Down at during temps. Sure. By the way, I got a. Tell me how many amps are driving through a mic via daisy chain. Five amps. I'd like to see any one of you guys hold a wire with five amps coming through it. And a five and a mic via, let's say a five mil mic via. If you have a five mil wire and drove five amps, I'd like to see how long you can hold on to it. She's gonna it's gonna fuse. So this new test went from 2.627 to the rest. This coupon is approved by IPC. You can build the coupons for free. It's on a website, you go on there and build it, and I highly recommend you build it exactly like the geometries of your board. If you have a laser beam that's a six mil or a 12 mil land, and very mechanical, it's five miles away, make it exactly like that, because there are things that fail when the microvia and the very mechanical are too close to each other. We've seen evidence, I'll share that with you guys. Uh, you test the whole coupon all the days you change during that thermal cycle. On an IST tester, you test, the, you test the, bar, the mechanicals first, you stress them out in the heat. Then you go to the microbias and you stress them out in the morning heat. Not really a valid test. If you go through assembly to both cycles, they should be both tested. So here's the coupon configuration. Here's an example of just microbial 1 to 2, 23 to 24 over there. I got 10 coupons. And then here is the testing what we saw before. One coupon is going to exceed the 5% threshold during the reflow temperature. And so now I want to show you some real case results. It's kind of embarrassing because they're my normals. But these are real failures that the test were caught. And then we looked at the cross section. We didn't go to the lab and say, yeah, no, these are bad ones, let's throw them in the test for five. We put them in the test and they fail. Why? And then we're like, oh, yeah, that would fail the process. 
But the OM tester during reflow caught these failures. Every single one of those except the three panels, three serial numbers passed. All the other ones failed, red. When we looked at them, this is a little bit embarrassing. We had a micro via void. IPC allows a 25% void in the micro via. As long as it's not in the calculator, this exceeds 25%. And it violates the cap plate. <laughs> that tester during reflow temperature cycle caught the other. Now you can cross section find that and say, yeah, that's not valid. We have to object it. Or you can throw the tester and say, this one will survive assembly. Here's an example of on the sixth cycle, it fails. So you can say, well, it may be okay, we don't really do six degree flows, but you kind of understand it. Maybe we should go back and look at the design and make it more reliable. Another example of a non-conformance found by the tester. You see here, we're pretty much nothing's exceeding the 5%, but we start hitting on the second cycle, third, fourth, and just more and more, and you get open. They're going open at reflow temperature, and they're reconnecting once it gets back down to ambient. So here are the fails. Coupon's red. And then there was a temperature cycle. Another embarrassment. What happened? This was a really large panel. It's like 24 by 36, and they misregistered the panel. The coupons have passed. The micro via target and capture pad are new. The ones that failed, they misregistered. And only half of the laser via <coughs> was inside the pad. 180 degrees, half the connection. During temperature recycling, <laughs> resistance went up. It cuts. And the amazing thing that I've seen so far is every time I have found a failure on decoupon on OMF testing, when I cross section and found the bad via, it was a non-conforming digit condition in IPC 6012 or 6018 or 6013 for low copper void, crack, flame void. They, they matched. There is a direct match compatibility, which is pretty good. It's really a fair test. Another real-world example. And this is the one I was talking about earlier. It's a 5 by micro -beam. How many of you guys use 5 by micro -beam? I did them all the time. We used to do fours, right? You know why? Board shops love fours. We love fives, not sixes, not seven, not eights. Because big in a micro vehicle, it's volume. We're vaporizing volume, we're plating back in volume. The more volume, the longer it takes. You want to do it faster? Make a small micro vehicle, laser plate quick, plate it faster. We love small micro vehicles because it makes your process go faster. This happens. It's a one to one aspect ratio. Might be a spot. When you do aspect ratio, you must include the starting point. This does not violate IPC. I used to do them for years until I finally realized the guy that told me 10 years before that, the six of might be a more loud. And when we test them, here's a reflow profile. There's the opens that occur. Here's the coupons. So it's a one, two, seven, eight, and very mechanical by itself, and mechanical through, and then this is uh, all together. So you'll see some pass and failures. But ultimately, what you see in the pattern, those are the ones that have micro in the coupon. Five mil laser, the dielectric. My planner used the 1080 106 for any of you guys that know that, uh, what those are. My rule is use two 106s and the six. I corrected the newbie. He redesigned it. He changed the dielectric from a 180, 1080, 106 to two 106s. He changed the leases, laser from five to six. The aspect ratio went from one to one to about 0.82 to one. I'd ideally like to see 0.75 or less. They remade the ones that just failed. There's a temperature recycle. There's 100% pass. Half of my human hair difference in dielectric, making it bitter, making the diameter of the microbial half of my hair thicker. That's it. That's the bed. Sometimes I'm getting them to go 100%. We're getting some sliders.
it's that close. And it's not like I've taken a subjective view looking at it and I think I don't see a crack. This is temperature on a 4 Kelvin wire at 260X is going, yep, that went open.
this is the end result. And they did it twice, pretty much the same result. All of the four staff members, we have some weird questions, so thank you for your time on this. All failed in the first cycle. This one went open. It didn't even like it. I can't get resistance. It just popped. It's gone. Four stack micro uses. And if you gave me the design for micro, I said, listen, you should redesign that. Take four to six weeks to redo it. You could jeopardize your engineering program. And I've seen this for two years. The whole program is contracts are lost because that happens. Now, these are small micro We below love those six numbers. So. These are the three stack. The highest I've ever got was four. They started going at two. And then the two stack, some of them went at two and three. And the three of my ideas didn't make it. Four is due. And, uh, but they didn't let me look at the cross section to see what they were showing us why. I still need that piece of information because the geometries are everything. If it's like a half stick ratio of 0.5 to 1, it's a reason why those fours and fives passed. I got a lot. Sure. Just because there's a lot of, especially people with my eyesight in the background, you can't read all this stuff, but you're going to make this available to you? Yeah, I got to turn it into a PDF format and send it to you guys. All right. This is a stack micro view. This is a customer who said, you got four stack micro view. Sure, you want it? Nope. You got a 10 mil pad and five mil laser. You're going to fail. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to be sitting going back and forth with you forever when you're blaming me because they're just going to fail. I'm going to be frustrated building stuff over and over again just to fail. And you're going to be upset because they're going to fail in your assembly. And it's just, I'm not doing it. Let somebody else do it. That's the coupons. This is our, these are three serial numbers. Serial number 9, serial number 10, serial number 11. And those are six mil micro days. All right. Of the three serial numbers, I lost two thirds. That's a fabricator. You really can't stay in business if you're throwing two thirds of the board to build the web. Especially with four lamination cycles at about 200 process steps, 250 process steps. I'm going to go all that way to throw two thirds of the trash. By the way, I'm going to get it in the center. Yeah. Good luck. What was the, what was the Z aspect? Good question. That's a 6 mil micro view. Uh, the aspect ratio is three, uh, the, the height is 3.8, and the diameter 6 is it's pretty close. It's 0.5 to 1.6 to 1. It's nice and sliding. It's good. Except there's four micro views. They're popping. And by the way, that's, that's the cross section coupon. The actual D coupon only got three and went off to a very mechanical. So they built some more. Five more uh, serial numbers. And they lost 40%. Again, four shots doing 240 process steps between four to six weeks doing this to throw that percentage away. The lemon is nice. <laughs> we don't. No, they don't. They don't. They really care about us. But they should have seen their faces right now when I said that. Sorry, Sorry guys. I couldn't resist. So, yes, sir. Is there a Not necessarily. The, the Barry McKenna, we're, we're, we're collecting data on this and looking at it. So I'm looking at all the results, all the passes, all the cross sections, diameter drills, how far they're spread out, and all this stuff. It's a lot of data to go through. I don't even know how many buckets of data I need to look at to look at a database over time. But I've collected 29 where I've done deep dives. I'm going to show you three deep dives in a second. Here. The total thickness nub is really the micro uh, aspect ratio laser via and then stack it. So, if you guys are interested in the decoupon or being able to test the decoupon, maybe there's three different strategies you can use. Yes. Yeah. Even single. So dog cloning doesn't make a lot of difference in the data. It does. Dog cloning because you stagger. Once you stagger, oh yeah, total difference. But you still have to have the right geometry for laser view the object right now. But staggering, highly recommended my demonstrations to designers like well, this micro via doesn't care where this micro via is. They don't have to be in the same plane. <laughs> staggering, the yields go up, you can spread things out and get more rounding chances. What's your method of uh, distance in staggering? Staggering micro I would say 
six or greater, from the edge of laser to edge of laser. But I'm finding out the laser, the edge of laser to the edge of very mechanical, which I'll go through these examples. I don't know the answer, but it appears to be a trigger. So there's three different strategies. I'd like to do ones. I'm not testing them, but if I need to test them because I'm doing some design or some new material or some construction, if in the event I have a separate problem, I can just take these coupons, put them in an OM tester, and see if they're good or not. So you can ask the board fabricator. When you build my boards, I want you to make B coupons with my micro B instruction. It's going to take us an extra 30 minutes. They'll get built along with the rest of the board. But there's no testing involved. There's no cost. There's no other thing other than the extra engineering costs. And we'll have the coupons. And it's like, man, this is having problems in the center. Do we have those B coupons? Let's put them in the chain and find out the failure. Yeah, they, they got a problem. Or no, they don't. So let's go look at our center because through the repo, they can survive. So it's not all right. You can do that. The second method is build my boards, make a coupons, ship them, and do coupon testing for data collection on them. It doesn't affect me delivering my parts that I built for you, but you can see the data collection. So if you're doing, I don't believe Jerry are going to that time. Maybe it's five. I'm going to do it anyway. So okay, I'll build it. But and I'll do coupon testing, but not for extent. It's data collection. If you agree and I agree with you, here's your results. We can discuss this a little what we can do to make things better. Or I was just full of it, they all passed, which could happen. Right? But you have to decoup us, but I saw I'm not gonna build boards just to throw them in the trash, but I know there's a high probability they're gonna end up in the trash. Just, I gotta have the boards, I don't have time to change them. Okay. We'll build it, we'll test, but it's not acceptance for delivery. Because I've already told you the design in a different way. And we do that with sign up. Okay. The third one is, especially the space guys, because you can't reuse components. When you're done building them, you're going to OM test them, and they've got to pass. If they pass, then you can ship me the parts. And what you do is, if a panel fails, that item is not going to ship. So if you have 20 panels and two fail, those two panels, parts from that panel, do not ship the rest of them. Okay, and that's good. Yes, sir. There's a good bit there. Philip Sutton. Uh, discussion, which I have in my. Uh, Assuming you have four people on the panel. Me personally, if I was an issue, if I was on the end of the customer uses, I don't want it. Yeah, that's a big step. If I had a failure on one coupon out of four on the panel, the other three passes, don't want it. Because there's something like it. And it's a small sample. Me personally, if any one of those coupons on a panel has failed, it's a small sample. You have a much larger sample in your board, so there's a probability you're going to find that on your board. And literally, if the ones that are bad, people don't assemble them, they don't have any problems with the ones that pass, even though the one panel failed, those passes are fine, they never come back. So, those are the three different strategies you can do. The, 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 this one's costly, it's the most costly, that one's almost the same cost as the paper for the test. But we're shipping parts. And that one really doesn't cost that much. <coughs> so, in summary, um, the test validation, the OM test validation has proved that the material has structural reliability for today's challenging pre circuit requirements. They validated it actual reflow temperatures, not calculated. It's a whole coupon that the reflow chamber tests the board. It detects failures at reflow that heals at room temperatures. Test reports on actual temperature on the coupon and resist values. Validation propagated via structure. That's all you have to buy. I can be a stag and all that. It's all on. The only failure and root cause evaluations are consistent with IPC 6012, 6013, whatever. When it fails in that reflow tester, you'll find that it would have failed that when you find that the specimen, the, the, the culprit. And data collection is allowed to have better design practices. As you look at the data that you've passed, you're going to be able to design things that are more reliable and better. So, how are we doing for time?
So, what is the solution? You, you identified that you know, all this has been in the board industry for a long time. Figures better than better if it's my review or anything else. Okay, for reliability. But well, what's the real solution? There's a couple of things we're working on. Because it is a real problem. We're looking at um, plating microvias. When we plate microvias, what we do is we make the microvia <coughs> very close. We couple and resist everything with the microvia, and we plate it in and out, making a bump. A dot. We pull the resist off, then we sand it. Just putting stress on the bottom of the microwave. So we have a new chemistry that we're testing on right now that'll play with the entire surface, but in the hole only, and come up, and there will be no sand. So what does that do for reliability or reliability improvement if we didn't sand and torque the microwave? Now think about it, I'm just torque it. The microwave bumps like two mils. The dielectric might be two and a half, three mils. You can think I'm hitting something almost 40% out. I'm going to whack it with a spinning, sanding disc of death. And it's going to hit it. <laughs> and torque it. So, what happens if I build boards and I don't torque? What a liability. Interesting. Electrons play is a big part of it. Actually, Monday I'm going to go look at some new chemistry that doesn't use electrons per se and builds up. Because what happens, electrolyte starts off very separated, they call it fluffy. And then it gets thicker and thicker above, but that zone where it's thin, that's where the separation occurs typically. But if we can make a strong bond between the foil of the target pad and electroplated copper, the thinnest area, maybe that will make it stronger. So maybe if we do that, maybe if we do the no sandy microvia formation, maybe we make it strong enough that they can survive through diameter and four diameter. And higher step. But right now, it looks to me the mismatch between glass epoxy expansion and copper not wanting to expand, it's just a mismatch. I can't do anything about it. Is there any kind of free edge or grinding going on on the target pads? There's things we do to the surface to help promote adhesion. There is things that we do. So, back to Tom's last comment. Is there enough metadata out there yet for the DFR tools for us to pre-analyze stuff? See me in a year. I might have more. <laughs> I've got, I could literally spend about two or three weeks with the raw data right now and try to make sense out of it and what is good, what's reliable, what works. Because I'm surprised certain things that do work that shouldn't work, and the other things like, yeah, if I said they wouldn't work, they don't work. Oh, he, he was a physicist. He looked at the epoxy glass, the combination of saline treatment of the epoxy to the glass, how strong it is, what, how much expansion. It's, what is it, modulus? What is it? The night guys can help me out. The uh, modulus of the expansion, at what temperature, and copper, and electrolytes, copper, electric foil, copper, which is a different grain structure than electroplate copper. He analyzed all that stuff and came back to six and said, What do you know, man? But he was right. I'm stubborn. So here's a couple of real world examples. Do not do this. It will guarantee to fail. I can go, you should, a lot of my presentations 10 years ago look like you might be a little dirty kind of boxes, sauces, all kinds of rattling. We can build them. They will electrically pass tests. That expansion there will pop that sucker off every single time. I got customers like, I had a board, I had a high, I didn't see the internet. And Barry McCann, he's going to say second. He's going to say the laser second. He's going to say the laser second. And then I stacked them over laser mechanical. And they all failed. Yeah, how would you know? They did. If you did a design that says this, Jerry, we won't hold you responsible. You build it, you charge us as you fail. I will roll around on the ground, cry to the blood's coming out of my eyes for you to redesign it because. This is, well, only least And that was a mistake, they built the coupon room. It was supposed to be staggered, the design was staggered. The camera department put it over the barrier of the camera because they didn't understand that it was supposed to be separated. So this is an interesting, Three stack microvias, don't do it. This one's half. 
Michael B. is your sixth grade. How do you like the stacking of this? Pretty sure. This is a key, and I don't know the number. I think it's 14. But this is even later to the edge. To the very mechanical drill edge. And it's 13.9, 14 mils. And you can see up here, staggering. That passed. This one came in the day before. And I got this. I got some of the pass and some of the fail. Two different nets. The dot indicates the one. And I go, oh, let me go see why I failed that. That's a process. It actually the laser is over one here. This was the next one that was there. And I go, well, why didn't you have one fail? Uh, only once. And the other one failed like more than half the time. Not half the time. Or more than half the time. So I looked at the coupons. My guys gave me the coupons. They put the very mechanical to the laser's edge cloud on this one. And on that one, they did six. And if you would have asked me four or five years ago, I would have told you guys, yeah, do it all day long. Laser gear, very mechanical, six in those spaces. I can make those all day long. And I can't, I'm not I can't, but not during reflow. I don't know why. I think there's some time laboring action going on between the very mechanical and the laser gears. And when they get too close, they show up. So this is a little jam because somebody built a coupon on I got to see two populations off the same coupon on And I go, oh, there's the difference if they're too close. Oh. So what I'm doing, every time I get a coupon, pass or fail, I'm looking at the laser views, I'm looking at their stagger, I'm looking at the very mechanical way, is it's going to start to collect data. And it looks like if you're 12 and under, sometimes some coupons show up as good. But when they're far enough away, they see the pass. So maybe they come back and say, hey, it might be a stack if you do this, you work. But I'm still giving a warning. You stack two. Stop. Stack it. Which is real hard to do. 0.35 at a point. Is that an edge of the I always do the mechanic, the, the, the drills. Edge of laser drill. Oh, the BS. No, not the BS. Not the pad. No, I'm talking. Laser the drill. <laughs> What's that? I don't know if the very mechanical diameter, uh, the diameter of it plays into it or not. Um, for the most part, one facility, almost all the very mechanicals end up being 7.9, sometimes they're 10, but usually because they're crowded stuff, they're 7.9. So I got constant repeating data on that. Uh, one of our other facilities uses large laser deals, and those men, I swear, they're like 7, 8 million, they go 24 cycles, they don't fail. They don't have the data on that. I don't have a lot of data collected on that. Uh, from what I've seen, they pass. Um, when it's going from top to bottom, I have one customer had data with them. Nice. When you work that, you can make a small or something. Yeah. Because the heat doesn't really penetrate all the way down. And there's, the, the, there's a whole different strains and stresses that go on. So, everything I've shared with you guys, I've collected data. I'm looking at it. I'm analyzing it. And a lot of the things that I've known at the diameters today, the aspect ratio is like, yeah, you see more players. Where other ones are, they go, all the cycles are needed and they're fine. Or they go 24 cycles and they're fine. So, these geometries play into it. And um, so, as we collect more data, we'll share more. And uh, when it gets to what we can share, um, we'll be happy to come and visit you guys to do that. So, uh, I appreciate your guys' time and listening to the questions.